Hello, this is episode five of the RJM Classic Motorcycles podcast. We are a father and son motorcycle restoration business established in 1989. This is the penultimate episode of the series, and later on in the show we have a short tip regarding tracing oil leaks. But our main topic this week is a discussion explaining a bit about how we operate as a business, going into some more detail about some things on our website. As you may know, you can visit our website at rjmclassic.com or email me about the podcast at rjmpodcast at gmail.com. Enjoy. One of the advantages of doing this podcast, and one of the reasons I was very keen to do it, is people who are considering bringing their pride and joy to us for work um, can get a sense of who we are and what we're about, because there's only so much you can read on a website. So if I go through the pay-as-you-go restoration section and the company ethos section on our website and read those, um, Ray will interrupt wherever he sees fit to go into a little bit more detail, as pay-as-you-go and our company ethos are very much the... uh, the things you need to know if you're looking at bringing your machine to us, you'd agree? Absolutely. So, RJM Classic Motorcycles Pay-As-You-Go Restoration. High-quality, durable restoration or major repairs for classic motorcycles is not an inexpensive activity, and it is an activity notoriously difficult to put a price on. Pay-As-You-Go is an affordable answer we didn't just dream up yesterday. It's tried, it's tested, it works. Its key feature is safeguarding against runaway bills and nasty surprises and provides restorations and major repairs completed to your time scale and budget. Yeah, it's probably worth interjecting at this point to give some insight into A, how this came about and B, how it works. Um, I knew, obviously, before I started this enterprise from my own projects that everything takes more man-hours and everything is more expensive than you thought it was going to be. Now, that's all very well when you're doing it for yourself, because the project just has to wait a little while till you've got more money or more time or whatever. But, of course, the moment you take a vehicle into a professional workshop, it can be entirely different. Now, um, we recognised that there needed to be some way of making what we do for you more like what you would do for yourself in another scenario. So, you know, it gives you an opportunity to maintain budgetary controls and to be able to monitor what is going on and actually make decisions as the project continues as to what your priorities currently are. To continue, pay-as-you-go is a zero-deposit solution we have been operating and refining for over a decade, well, significantly more than that at this stage, and which is more relevant now than at any other time. Well, that bit that bit withstands, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And and again, um, whether it's you know a machine that you've acquired with the intention of restoring, having it restored, restoring it yourself, whether it's um, a project you started many years ago and has stalled, um, all these form regular parts of of what we do, um, and Again, uh, in the course of the project, all sorts of things may come to light. I mean, there was one that uh, was brought to us in packing crates. um, And it was an A65, which I was familiar with, but there was any number of bits that I wasn't quite familiar with. Um, And this turned out to be a guy called Craig who'd actually unwittingly bought himself a Lightning Clubman. Wow. In bits. See, there, there are there are still hidden gems out there, as we talked about in the buyer's guide. Absolutely. The essentials of the system are that work is completed in more or less £500 increments, at which point a stage payment becomes due. At the same time, details of the work completed to date are reported verbally, as well as an outline of proposed operations for the next session. Uh, in this day and age, that's more in the way of emails, isn't it? Exclu- well, pretty much exclusively. I mean, you'll get an email from me that will say I'm... Please to report further progress we've worked to your whatever it happens to be. I will then go on to say, since we last spoke, we have now done X, Y and Z. Um, We've encountered A, B and C. Uh, In the next session, we plan to do... um, D, E and F. Or even the F and G. (laughs) Um, What happened to D? We're saving D until the end, presumably. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. Um, And... uh, um, I, I, at that point, I will tell you what the current outstanding balance is, and we will um, uh, 
seek payment at that stage. Normally, by this time, we've we've uh, uh, had a discussion and we're looking after your credit card details, um, and we will ask permission to draw down a further five hundred pounds um, and your permission to continue with the work. Um, but this being when convenient for you. So, in other words, you know, you can set the pace um, by how quickly we get that next lot of funding. Yeah, and just to continue with, with what's written down here, your agreement will be required before proceeding further, followed shortly thereafter by your payment on account. In practice, the credit limit, for want of a better term, may well be extended by mutual consent as the relationship develops. That's true, yeah. Sometimes if um, if it's a complete restoration, for example, some people choose to only keep in touch with us every few months, and as a result, they like us to go ahead in, in, in bigger chunks. Yeah, I mean, this, this actually um, is something i'm developing more seriously now because um i'd always assumed um that most people uh, that would bring a project to us um we would be the the surrogate parents of it if you like in the sense that they either haven't got the time um or the ability or whatever to do it so we're doing it for them um and for those that that class of client um the process is as much part of the enjoyment as the fin finished product. So on that basis, we assume, you know, people would like regular contact if they're local-ish, a regular opportunity to pop them, you know, pop in and, and see it in the flesh uh, develop. So, you know, the, the, the process is, is, is to some extent as in, enjoyable as the finished product will be. There are, however... You know, a significant number of clients now for whom the process means absolutely nothing. Um, and as a consequence, for those sorts of clients, we, we are seriously now developing, a, a, if you like, a parallel system um, whereby basically, you know, we'll do it in, for argument's say two grand lumps rather than 500 pound lumps. Um, and, you know, um, that... Uh, parallel version of pay as you go is 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 maturing quite nicely now. Yeah. Um, the last paragraph of this is the pivotal issue is that in effect the contract again for the want of a better term is renewed at each stage. In simple terms, if at any point there is a change of heart or circumstances, or indeed you decide I have made as that's we these days we have made as much progress with the project as you need us to, you're welcome to settle your account and take the bike home with our blessing. In these circumstances, we're always more than willing to give advice by phone to clients wishing to finish projects off at home. We're also more happy for the bike to be returned to the shop if you hit a sticky patch. Yeah, and that happened um, just a f six months or so ago, didn't it? Yeah, um, it's it's by no means a unique situation. I mean, um, to for for the owner to co commit himself um, in in entire in its entirety to a project of that sort of magnitude. Um, is a big ask yeah. uh, to expect us to to commit ourselves um, to that extent is also a big ask um, and you know in recognition of our keenness for people to be you know more involved in the project uh, than just taking it somewhere having it done and paying a bill at the end um, and our keenness also to um, make it affordable and by that i don't mean cheap i mean you know having the, the the budgetary tools in place to to allow it to happen now sometimes you know and, and and over the course of a project whether it's done you know over several years or several months or or whatever um people's circumstances particularly in this day and age can change can change massively you know we've had redundancies we've had serious illnesses we've had um divorces di divorces um you know, and pretty much all the projects that we've embarked upon have survived those experiences mm. because if you hit a problem and you can't commit to, to those sort of um, levels of funding on an immediate basis, we're quite happy to, to, to give the project a holiday for a few months and look at it again then. Uh, we're quite happy to slow the, the project up. Obviously, from a commercial standpoint, there are limits to that. Of course, yeah. Um, but you know, within within what we can physically do, we're we're happy to to oblige. Um, and you know, again, if the whole nature of the project turns out to be entirely different, 
I mean, there was an example not long ago. Chap brought an oil in frame A65 to us that he was convinced, and we go back to this again, it's only done 8,000 miles from new. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, when we got it apart, it had been through hell on earth. Um, you know, it was more like 180,000 that this thing had probably done over. I wouldn't years. be surprised and, looking and, at it. And, 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 you know, sort of sat out in a, in a damp car park every winter's <laughs> day um, outside the, the dark satanic factory. <laughs> um, and, you know, I actually took the, the lead on that and said, look, this is a vastly different project from what you thought you were getting into. Um, you know, and unless you, you know, accept what it is and make a decision as to whether you've got the funding going forward with this, I think actually you're better off paying your bill and taking it away because this could get seriously, seriously expensive. But on the other hand, you know, as bad as it is, it can be done if you want it, and it can be done to our usual high standard. But, you know, the choice is yours. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of my favourite aspects of the pay-as-you-go <clears throat> system is the link between um, cost and time. Yeah, I mean, we, we do actually mention on, on the website that, you know, the speed of these projects can be tailored to suit one of the um, uh, easiest tools by which that is affected. As I say the speed at which you respond to my request for further funding. Um, you know, if We're it, not going to send the boys around if you don't make contact with a week, in, in a couple of weeks. Well, no, and, but, but um, if somebody is keen for us to, to press on, yeah. um, then quick responses um, you know, are indicative of a higher priority required and we respond accordingly. Also on our website, you will find our recently added company ethos section. Um, so if I read through it so you know what we're talking about, I'll then ask Ray to pick up on a few points. Here goes. Our company ethos. We pride ourselves that our charge-out rates are amongst the lowest in the industry whilst producing a quality of workmanship that is equal to the best. We also take great pride in our premises and equipment as well as our level of organisation. We hope that equals a great customer experience. We do have the advantage that we own the freehold of our commercial property and are therefore not subject to constant rent hikes. We even cracked a great deal on the mortgage for the property, so even the cost of that is quite modest. Granted, our modest rates do have the benefit to us of discouraging fast buck merchants from trying to get a foothold in the industry, although we did recently spot a presumably relative newcomer on the south coast with a whopping charge-out rate of £50 per hour plus VAT. We say good luck with that. Fact is that Rowan, that's me, and I, that's you, have no desire to be rich and are happy to get by on an average industrial wage with no consideration for the hundreds of thousands of pounds invested in plant equipment and premises over the last 25 years. To be fair, no one would do this job just for the money. Pride, enthusiasm, and because it's who we are and what we're good at plays its part. However, we do need to make a living as it's our sole occupation and not a subsidised lifestyle business. At the same time, we're very keen indeed not to give the impression that we are some kind of budget repairer. I'm certain that there are still those working in the industry for whom it represents a bit of extra income over and above their regular salary or pension, which is great. Indeed, when we're approached by somebody seeking major repairs on an obscure lightweight of limited value, we recommend that we try to seek these people out. This type of operator does have the advantage that they can afford to estimate a job on largely guesswork and not worry too much if the work takes many times longer than expected. That said, I've heard too many tales of work being abandoned and much worse. We recognised years ago that with vehicles that have not seen the inside of a professional workshop in half a century or more, repair estimates are at best misleading and at worst downright dishonest. And whilst we're quite happy to talk openly and honestly about average costs of similar work completed to date, we will not appear to give certainty where there can be none by producing an estimate. We prefer instead to give what certainty we can with our unique pay-as-you-go scheme, the aforementioned pay-as-you-go scheme. In tandem with our modest charge-out rates, we believe this affords us the luxury of taking the time needed to get the job right rather than doing a half-baked job in order to comply with a half-baked estimate. We would highlight the fact that we talk about our charges as being including VAT rather than the industry norm of plus VAT. This is an innocuous enough piece of verbal shorthand but makes a big difference these days when VAT is 20%. A £500 bill can turn out to be £600. This makes the difference between us and the rest even more impressive and all the more tricky to achieve. To those who will say, I'll pay cash, I don't need an invoice, which we would presume to mean I don't want to pay the VAT, I would say, don't come here. We don't do cash deals. I would go on to explain that actually we're able to absorb up to half the cost of the VAT because we don't bulk out our turnover with dubiously profitable over-the-counter parts sales which allows our turnover to comfortably qualify for what is known as flat rate VAT, which is a considerable saving to us which we pass on.
So, Ray, one of the things we mentioned there was that level of organisation. Um, explain for the listeners how exactly that manifests itself and why that's so important. Well, I think um, most importantly, of course, is we couldn't run the scheme we run and we couldn't deal with the volume of work we deal with um, unless we had a good infrastructure and unless we were particularly well organised. Um, and obviously paperwork is a big uh, part of that. Um, clearly when we are working typically on 30 odd projects at any given time, you need to be able to know exactly where you are with those projects so that when you come back to them, um, if say for example we've been waiting for uh, permission to draw down funds on a particular job, we need to know within minutes where we la where we were with the job last and where we're picking up from so that there's no waste of time. It's not a, an extra cost penalty to the clients. So partly it's about paperwork, partly it's about um, the premises itself um, and how it, you know, is has been developed to lend itself to um, not only circulating the jobs through the workshop, but also, more importantly, keeping it uh, secure and dry um, and not coming to any harm the rest of the time. Obviously, we don't have, as we see it, the advantage that modern repairers have got where half the vehicles they're working on on any given day will be sitting outside in the rain. That's not an option for us. So it's it's multifaceted, but um, uh, it's actually... Um, takes quite a lot of development to get to where we have got to and obviously all the time we're making you know nuanced changes to it to to improve the system still further yeah i mean i think one of the things we did more recently in the last year or two was actually properly sitting down every saturday well just before we've recorded this this bit of the podcast um and going through everybody's job card and saying, you know, where are we? What's the next thing we need to do? Who needs an email? Who do we need to order bits from? Who can we crack on with? Indeed. I mean, obviously, five or six years ago, um, I used to have that meeting with myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure it was, uh, it was a bit of a dangerous moment when you had to ask yourself for a pay rise every now and then. Indeed. Uh, it says in the company ethos page about estimates being misleading. Um, I mentioned this for discussion because we actually had a really good example of that just uh, a week or two ago, didn't we? As is frequently the case, um, you're presented with um, a machine which is cosmetically really very good, um, and the assumption has to be that you know it's probably, or it must surely be, as mechanically sound as it is cosmetically beautiful. But of course, there hangs the tail. Um, the current owner of this particular bike, which is actually a, a TR6 SS, which is uh, a pre-unit but duplex framed a Triumph with a single carburetor, was presented to us um, having erratic or loss of drive, which, um, I mean, the initial um, possible diagnosis has got to be one of either gearbox or clutch. Um, and it may have been minor, it may have been major. Um, so obviously we went looking in the first instance to the primary drive, <clears throat> took the cover off and, you know, the primary chain scraping along the bottom of the case. Um, and it's clearly uh, this big was reputed to have done about 900 miles since it was fully restored. Clearly, um, the primary chain has never been adjusted in all of that time. And if it ever was properly adjusted, um, so obviously that needs addressing initially and in the process of trying to do that we realize the reason um, that it's never been adjusted properly is because you can't physically adjust it on this particular machine because some nun nutty dalian from the planet dork decided to add an additional uh, stirrup to the uh, gearbox adjusting uh, device on the drive side as well as the one on the timing side now this looks fine and dandy and quite a reasonable upgrade until you realise that the primary chain case inner is then in the way of that and you can't actually get a spanner on it to adjust it. It clearly never had been adjusted right from day one and instead of having realised their mistake, the builder clearly then decided, oh, well, that'll be all right and just bolted it all up and 
let it go out like that. So as a consequence, you know, you've got a major problem straight away. And one which, you know, first of all, we're looking at something that might be more major. Then we're looking at something that might be less major. Now we're looking at something that's more major again because we've now got to take the inner primary cover off and get rid of all this extra upgraded nonsense so we can then put it back and then we can then adjust the primary chain. Yeah, and um, it's just as well we did remove the inner primary cover because that allowed us to see that the lock tab washers, um, which form part of the center stand mounting arrangement, um, were not deployed, nor was the uh, lock tab washer for the gearbox sprocket nut. Yeah, it was there. Nobody bent it over, though. Yeah. How strange. And, and, and the real coup de grace, of course, is it then transpired that the main uh, drive side oil seal had not only lunched itself but have been put in the wrong way around anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get on to the, uh, the spacer that goes on the stud that the footrests mount on that um, lives just behind the inner primary cover and, and sits up against the engine mounting plate. That was um, too thin and I could waggle it backwards and forwards with, with my finger. With the obvious consequence that if you tried to tighten the um, drive side footrest up meaningfully, you'd then pinch the outer cover to the inner cover and the inner cover to the engine plate. So the whole primary chain case would now be uh, probably distorted, but certainly under a lot of pressure. Yeah, so uh, a problem that starts off, you go into it thinking, oh, maybe we'll need to replace the clutch plates and, uh, and put some different oil in there perhaps, um, escalates into something a whole lot more meaningful. Yeah, I mean, this is all aside from the fact that the, the clutch plates were complete rubbish anyway. Um there, there is still a lot of these plates around that appear to be slivers of cork stuck onto a steel plate with black mastic. Um, you know, we really can do better in this day and age. And there's you know, no excuse for not putting Surflex or some other similar brand of, of plate in, which, you know, are pretty much fit and forget. And the other thing, time and time and time again, people replace friction plates, but bear no heed to the steel plates, most of which are anything but flat. Um, and we found years and years ago that if you, unless you've got perfectly flat plane plates, then you can be sitting there trying to balance that clutch up till hell freezes over. But the moment you fit some decent plain steel plates, it almost adjusts itself. The last thing I want to ask you is why do you stress that our charge out rate is inclusive of VAT, and why do you go out of your way to call out people who want to do cash deals? Oh, VAT. V8, don't get me started. There's a bloody fiscal euphemism uh, and, and a bit of uh, financial obfuscation, if you like. Value added tax. It doesn't add any value. It's like stamp duty. The name means it's, nothing. It's, it's jack the price up hideously tax. No, I, 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 could, I could have a, a, a five-hour rant on the subject of VAT, but before I do so... Um, you know, it has to be paid. That is the law. And if you think for one moment that I'm so desperate for work that I've got to risk imprisonment to be able to do a job for you at a price which you might like, there's no advantage whatsoever. But there are sensible ways of, what shall we say, negating the cost as we do. Um, but first and foremost, I have to say it, it is a hideous amount of money um, I still can't believe that there's not rioting in the streets. <laughs> when when you um, arrive at a situation where in most cases every transaction that goes on in the high street, the government are taking more out of that transaction than the retailer themselves. You know, how can that be healthy for business? Um, you know, obviously it came in in the 1970s with 8% VAT when VAT first came along and yes it was a replacement for purchase tax so fair enough and then it crept slowly up and slowly up never went back down again or very <laughs> seldom only soon to go back up again if it did um and we arrived at 15 percent. and then of course um dear old maggie thatcher got herself in financial trouble over the poll tax so we then went up to 17 and a half percent um never gone down again and then we have 2008 the financial crisis mm -hmm. And they stick it up to 20%. It's never going back down again. But at the end of the day, that's the law. If you want the law changed, talk to your MP. Don't expect me to do the job that free. No, as you, as you say, them's the rules. And I think uh, any business that will say, yeah, go on, you know, let's, let's do a cash deal is 
obviously quite happy to to screw over the the government and i think the sort of person that would do that is the sort of business that would screw you over by by you know spending two hours to do something and charging you three yeah it does it does um show what direction their moral compass might be pointing in um but as 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 we uh, explained on the uh, website because we are able to keep our turnover um, to a sensible level, which obviously is is going to limit our potential for growth in the future. But mm. you know, there's never going to be any more people here than there is now because we are it. Yeah. Um, so to be able to maintain the current turnover, to be able to qualify for flat rate VAT, um, works nicely for us, and it means you know when we had the last hike in VAT to to twenty percent. We didn't actually have to put our charge out prices up, but the fact that the the uh, retail motor industry in general always quote VAT separately again, um, it's it's um, it's dishonest because they're almost absolving themselves of any connection with this charge. And you know, you turn up, you're expected to pay, you know, five hundred pound for the job, and all of a sudden it's six hundred. Oh well, there's VAT on top, mm. which is something. You know, we are completely out of step with the rest of the retail motor industry because we always quote inclusive of VAT. Well, I hope that was informative. As promised, up next, it's a short tip to help with oil leaks. This week's piece of advice was first pioneered, I'm going to say, Mm -hmm. uh, when you were trying to trace some very troublesome oil leaks and it dawned upon you that you could exploit a property of the oil to aid the tracking of said leaks. Yeah, the essential problem was that we got this very oily um, matchless G12 um, and not all the oil leaks were obvious. Clearly we dealt with the ones we could, but it had a, a strange manifestation in that you would have this constant drip, drip, drip of oil off the bottom end of the back of the silencer on the right hand side. And whereas you could trace the oil leak path to some extent, it all started to to disappear and become uh, much vaguer as it sort of got to the back of the oil tank, as as I traced the essential source from. Um, And um, we'd made various attempts to cure what we thought was the leak. Um, And then something which I'd sort of half realised for some time, with the advent of a lot of the uh, hand lights and torches we use being LED rather than tungsten, um, one was aware that engine oil had a certain uh, fluorescence to it, new fresh engine oil this is, um, and I suddenly wondered whether if you could get a handheld ultraviolet light device um, that this might help in the process. And at this point when I had this sudden revelation, I had no idea whether such a thing existed. Um, and went on eBay and there they were, looked like regular um, ultraviolet light, I'm sorry, regular uh, LED torches, but these were ultraviolet light torches. And I thought, well, I'm going to order one and see whether this helps. And boy, did it ever. Um, all of a sudden, you know, where there had been darkness, there was complete clarity because I've now got this bright fluorescent trail coming out of the back of the oil tank. And having then investigated it further, it turned out, and this is a, a peculiarity to, to cheap or matchless, an AGS where inside the oil tank there's a baffle plate and the baffle plate is spot welded onto the back of the oil tank and of course this had vibrated and caused one of the spot welds to fatigue just to emit this little little trail of oil that um, and um, one of these days we'll put the pictures on our website comparison of the back of this oil tank in normal light and then in ultraviolet light and you know the difference is chalk and cheese and we've since frequently use this torch to detect leaks that actually we had no idea even existed. Yeah, it's really surprising that uh, it works. It's all right saying it in theory, but it's only when you see it glowing away there. It's quite so impressive. I mean, you were, I remember you showed it to a, a customer and he was quite surprised. Yeah, I mean, I'd always been aware that, that fluorescent dyes were used in, in various leak diagnosing purposes. And obviously the, the most usual automotive one um, is on air conditioning systems um, and you know you obviously buy the kit with the dye in it and, and so on and so forth but of course um, what I hadn't realised up until then is most motor oils 
um, for cosmetic purposes, when they're fresh, have got really quite a, a large fluorescent dye content to them, um, which means we don't even need to add anything. You just reach for the UV torch. Yeah, no, I, I hear you saying about that. But what I was getting at was I'd love you to share with the listeners what did uh, uh, our dear customer, Mr. Nichols, say when you showed him just how wonderful the UV torch was. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he said, goodness me, he said that's as plain as the bollocks on a dog. <laughs> That's all for this week. You've been listening to me, Rowan, and my father, Ray. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and give us a review on iTunes. Just a reminder, our website is rjmclassic.com, and you can contact me directly about the podcast at rjmpodcast at gmail.com. See you next week for the final episode of the series.